Hello, I am Gabe Turan, and today I'm going to present to you about teens and substance use, what's new, and what adults need to know. And just as a quick introduction for myself, I'm Gabe Turan, and I am a certified addiction treatment counselor in the state of California. I actually have two certifications for addiction treatment counseling, and uh, I want to thank the Conejo Valley Unified School District for um, arranging all of this for me to be here and present this information to you. So we have some really important information to go over, so I'm just going to go ahead and dive right in. So first, when we talk about substance use and we talk about, um, you know, uh, addiction, we have to know that change is really what's at stake here. And change can be sudden or it can be gradual in our lives. When it comes to substance use, typically the change that happens around it is very gradual where slowly over time there will be changes and there will be different preferences and different priorities. And it's just something that happens gradually as time goes on for a person who's using substances. And as we go through this, hopefully you'll see uh, how that's the case. Now, I'd also like you to kind of think of this as a frame of reference as we go through this presentation as well. So think to yourself, what type of discussion or education did you receive when you learned about substance use. For some folks, that may be education through programs that were implemented in the school. Sometimes we heard about it from family members or other adults. Sometimes we heard nothing at all. But I just hope that you can think back to your earliest education around substance use and what that looked like for you. All right, so now I wanna start with e-products. And these could be vapes, e-cigarettes, vape pens, jewels. There's a lot of different names, but know that they are all essentially the same product, even though they look a little bit different. So as a quick history lesson, these started back in 2007, 2008 to really take off in North America. And they started in other countries, but came here around that time. And the first generation, as you can see here, uh, looked like an actual cigarette. And it operated much in the same way that the modern products do, till, do still, and that is that they had a battery and a liquid and a instantly heated up and um, created that liquid into an aerosol, as we'll talk about later. And uh, you can see these uh, other ones that are larger products called mods. Those are typically associated with an older young adult crowd or those who change over to vaping from smoking or did at this, this point in time. And know that uh, as time went on, there was an evolution of these products where they still operate much in the same way, but they look a lot different. And if you look at the examples here of some more modern generation products, you can see that these contemporaries look nothing like cigarettes. And the designs are very sleek, very different. And the idea there is absolutely to associate nothing with tobacco of the past generations. The idea here is that there's a different product for a different generation. It's sleek, it's modern, it's sophisticated. And as you can see here, a lot of these don't even look like they would be vaping devices. And some of them look like uh, USB chargers, or they may look like flash drives or pens. And so just know that uh, these designs are intentionally done. And as time has gone on now, the more modern products are all disposable, meaning that some previous products and some products on the market today are meant to be kept long term, and that you just recharge the battery just as you re recharge any type of a device that you would keep for a long, a long period of time. These disposable ones are only meant to be for a certain period of time until the juice runs out and then they're meant to be disposed of. And Puff Bar is one example here, as you can see. These are some additional modern products that are also disposable. Uh, there's some that are called Drag Bar, Health Bar, and uh, Vaporlax. And uh, you can see, again, the designs here are very sleek, colorful, and resemble nothing like traditional tobacco products. So now let's talk about usage by youth. And according to the California Healthy Kids Survey, when we look at lifetime use of cigarettes versus e-products, you can see the difference there. And on each left side, you have the uh, measurement for lifetime cigarette usage by a certain grade level. And on the right-hand bar, which looks like a vape, you have the lifetime vaping usage or e-product usage by those same grades. And so you can see, for example, in seventh grade at the 2019-2021 uh, administration of the survey, 2% of seventh graders said they'd ever tried a cigarette in their entire life, compared to 7% who said they'd ever tried a vaping product or an e-product ever in their life. 
For ninth grade, it's 4% versus 12%. And for 11th grade, 8% versus 22%. And what this data suggests is that over time, if you look longitudinally at tobacco cigarette usage in Ventura County and the state of California, it has gradually declined over the last 20 years. And that can certainly be attributed to work around public health, work in policy, work in education through our education system. Young people today know the risks that come along with cigarette usage. And many of them, as you can see from this data, would likely never touch a cigarette because they know of those risks. But many of them don't see e-products the same way. And so the uh, challenge here is how do we have them make that association? You may also hear from young people or adults that there's this perception that e-products or vapes are somewhat safer or different from cigarettes. And when we think about it, the idea behind them is delivering nicotine, which is the active addictive ingredient in, uh, in tobacco products, but nicotine is delivered no matter what. And the most popular products on the market today that young people uh, will use in vaping products, all of them contain nicotine. All those disposable products I showed you earlier, those all contain nicotine. There are no nicotine-free products that young people are gravitating towards. And I bring that up because as you can see here, this is a Juul pod and Juul is uh, previously the largest uh, manufacturer of um, e-products and they've since gone a little bit down on that list. Uh, but know that in uh, just a couple of years ago, Stanford Medicine did a quick study and looked at Juul pods and determined that this particular type of Juul pod had 41.3 milligrams of nicotine in its content in that little pod in that juice. And uh, if you do apples to apples, that's the equivalent of nicotine content in 41 cigarettes. So if you know a person or encounter someone who says that they can go through one of those pods a day, well, that's the equivalent amount of nicotine is smoking 41 cigarettes or two packs plus one more cigarette. And so know that when it comes to nicotine delivery, there's not a whole lot of gain here in somebody choosing to use e-products versus using um, e-cigarettes, excuse me, cigarettes. And again, those modern disposable products, which are the most popular ones on the market today, they all contain nicotine. Some of them have higher concentrations of nicotine than Juul does. So you may hear them referred to as vapes. Well, do they actually contain water vapor? Is that what comes out when a person inhales and exhales? And the answer is no, that is not water vapor. Previously, that was a uh, misconception or something was shared that it was just water vapor coming out and it was safer. The reality of it is that it's actually an aerosol. And when, um, if you think about it, if we get an aerosol can of air freshener, for example, and if I were to spray it on my hand, I would feel the oils and everything that's suspended in that aerosol on my hand, right? And so it's uh, different from water vapor that's evaporating from a boiling pot of water. If I safely, safely hold my hand over a boiling pot of water, you can feel the evaporation, but it goes away on my hand. I can't feel oil or any kind of chemicals that are suspended in the evaporated water. So when we talk about aerosol, um, when somebody inhales, from using a, an e-product or a vaping device, they are inhaling that aerosol, which is instantly aerosolized by the product itself, and they exhale that as well. So keep that in mind, it's not water vapor. So next, let's talk about the appeal. Why do young people even get the, get, gravitate towards these things? Why does it even get their attention? So very quickly, I would like to um, compare it to another product on the market that is consumable. And let's look at cereal here, for example. And you'll see here multiple generations of Lucky Charms. And some of you watching this may recognize some of this artwork from you when you were young. And you can see it's changed over time, the design of the box. However, there are some things that have stuck throughout time. In a consumable product, getting young people's attention, there are three things that can be done that will absolutely get a young person's attention for that given product. One is bright flavors, excuse me, bright colors. The second is sweet flavors. And the third is easy to remember names. So when we think back to the Lucky Charms picture, over multiple generations, these three components were still maintained on that box. Bright colors, sweet flavors, easy to remember names, right? So when we think of other products that contain these three components, do we have Colors, sweet flavors, easy to remember names. 
And someone could certainly counter, well, adults enjoy consuming these products as well, which I will absolutely agree with because I will say my favorite candy is absolutely pictured on this slide as well. But I would also counter with, would those adults start consuming those products as adults? And when we think about it, those three components are one uh, proven strategy to get a young person's attention or a youth audience. So when we look back at those modern disposable products again, do we see bright color, excuse me, do we see bright colors? Do we see sweet flavors? Do we see easy to remember names such as Puff Bar, Blueberry Ice, Peach Ice, and Cucumber, right? We see these uh, components here. And again, looking at these uh, examples from earlier of the most popular products from the most previous year, Drag Bar, Color, Sweet Flavor, Easy to Remember Name. So keep these things in mind. And this is the things that we're up against when we try to provide information to young people so they can make an informed decision, there are already um, psychological strategies being used to get their attention and make them curious or think about using the product. All right, so now having talked about that, let's talk about some of the health effects of e-products. And right away, there are some short-term health effects which are well-documented and they tend to be short-term in that someone may experience it for a little while, goes away after they stop using for a little bit, comes back, and use again, or maybe they'll be acclimated. They won't get so much of a dry cough or dizziness or nausea. These are short-term health effects that uh, could be included in key product usage. However, when we talk about long-term effects, remember I mentioned that these didn't start taking off in this country until about 2007, 2008. And though there hasn't been enough time when you look at the decades and decades of research behind cigarettes, so long-term effects are still largely unknown. Some of the earliest concerns are around the accumulation of heavy metals. Chromium, nickel, lead, and zinc have been called out in one study. Uh, there's also the knowledge gap or low perceived risk of harm. As I mentioned, there are folks who still believe that there's water vapor that, are, that is inhaled and exhaled from them. But there's also the nicotine content that I mentioned earlier. And um, folks not knowing that there's that much nicotine that they're ingesting and setting themselves up for addiction, which we'll talk about later towards the end of this presentation. Keep in mind also there's secondhand exposure to think about. Again, there's decades and decades of research around secondhand exposure to tobacco traditional cigarettes. When we look at e-products, there still hasn't been a whole lot of time that's passed, but using a, a, an e-product in an environment where someone is involuntarily exposed, that is secondhand exposure to that person. And more research is still needed to evaluate this because uh, it still hasn't been quite enough time to see what happens when someone is expand, exposed secondhand to these products. Of course, the initial concern is around the metals that I mentioned in the previous slide, um, especially lead in children. And unfortunately, when we talk about secondhand exposure, history has shown us that children, spouses, and pets are typically the people who are most likely to be exposed by um, someone who is using a vaping product or smoking around someone else. Okay. Lastly, I would like to mention Prop 31. This is a proposition that you may recall from the November 2022 election. You might have seen it on the ballot and it was in the state of California and all the voters had overwhel overwhelmingly decided to approve Prop 31, which is a statewide flavored tobacco ban. This bans the sale of most flavored tobacco products in the state of California. So it would be the sweet and sweet, sweet flavored vapes I mentioned earlier, menthol cigarettes, uh, uh, these cigarillos or small mini cigars you can see on the right hand side there, as well as chewing tobacco that is flavored like menthol or other flavors besides tobacco flavor itself. If you see these at any, um, any tobacco shop or a shop that sells tobacco products in the state of California, the enforcement of that is uh, left on local jurisdictions. So if you see that being sold, you are being encouraged by the state to let your uh, local law enforcement know, and they will uh, have to approach the retailer to let them know that they're selling products that are not allowed to be sold in the state of California anymore. All right, so now we're gonna move on to cannabis. And know that a lot of the things I mentioned about vaping and e-products just now, cannabis in, in concentrated form, such as wax pens, dabs, um, those can be vaped as well. Everything I just said about vaping um, would also apply to cannabis concentrates when they're ingested in that form. 
So what I'm going to do for this particular section is I'm going to focus on edibles. And edibles are um, any type of a product that is laced with THC or made with THC in it as an ingredient, and then the person ingests that orally, they eat it, yeah, or they could drink it as well. When we talk about edibles, there's something that's really important to think about with these. Because it goes uh, differently than somebody smoking or vaping uh, the cannabis, it, it, it's ingested differently and it hits that person differently. So it takes longer for them to feel the effects it's going to be more time needed for them to sober up. And one serving or a concentration can vary between products, which I'll we'll look at in just a second. And there's also the um, issue of accidental over-ingestion. So let's say we have gummy bears that um, are uh, THC edible gummy bears, right? If a person takes one of those and they're only supposed to take one, then they wait, you know, a half hour, 35 minutes, and they think, I'm not really feeling it yet. So they take another one, they've essentially doubled the dosage, but it's not going to hit them right away because it takes a while for it to go into the stomach and the large intestine to get um, absorbed into the bloodstream and then go to the brain for them to feel the effects. So that's how people can accidentally over ingest it. But people would also ingest it not knowing that it's a THC product. I think it's an actual legitimate product that is not with THC. So as an example here, when you look at this product, you have the um, uh, non-THC M&Ms on the left, and then you have a THC-laced uh, product on the right. They look very similar in packaging, and the product itself looks similar. You, hear, you have here uh, some gummies as well. On the left is the non-THC product. On the right is the THC product. And then this last example here, you can see the similarities in packaging as well. And so I hope you can understand uh, when I mentioned that someone can accidentally ingest it, let's say somebody finds the uh, packaging, such as a small child or someone who's unaware that it's uh, it contains THC, they could ingest the whole bag thinking it's a regular bag of chips or it's a regular bag of gummies. And that can absolutely lead to uh, an over-ingestion or an overdose of THC. And a person will go to the emergency department present with these uh, issues of typically, it looks like a, a panic attack uh, high heart rate, paranoia, just feeling very anxious. And unfortunately, as I mentioned, there's no antidote to that. They just have to wait it out for it to go through their system. It's a very uncomfortable feeling for folks who've experienced it. And emergency departments will tell you that they see it and uh, they start to recognize when that might be something. And people might not be always forthcoming that they ingested THC. So let's talk quickly about THC and the teen brain. And these changes, uh, there are changes that happen with a regular and heavy use of cannabis. And when it comes to cannabis use in the teen brain, any substance that's introduced into the uh, developing teen brain and body has an effect on their development. THC and cannabis are not an exception to that. And you can look at behavioral and academic changes that will come with it. And as time goes on and uh, regular or heavy use occurs and there's more frequency of use. It's typically when someone might see behavioral and academic changes, less motivation or less interest in things that used to interest them. You'll also notice maybe a um, deficit or a reduction in memory or learning or attention. All things that are very, very important for a young person who's in middle school and high school. They're developing these uh, skills still and developing their memory and learning and attention as they go through school, uh, preparing them for college and career. If that is dulled by cannabis use during the teen years, I hope you can understand the issue that can cause later on in young adulthood and adulthood. There's also some mental health considerations. You can see that there is research out there uh, that is looking at the connection between schizophrenia and depression and those being accelerated as an onset for uh, young people who use during their teen years, use cannabis during their teen years, and seeing if that might have happened anyways, or if maybe it wasn't going to happen, um, and then it happened because of the cannabis. It's hard to say, but the research is very interesting on that and seeing how uh, young people um, actually have exacerbated mental health considerations when it comes to cannabis use during their teen years. There's also accidental injury. And you may have heard people say, oh, nobody's ever died from an overdose of THC or cannabis. 
And I would counter with, there are certainly documented cases of people who have died from secondary causes because they were under the influence or heavily under the influence and they accidentally stepped off into the street and didn't notice that a car was coming or they have fallen and injured themselves or they've gotten behind the wheel or chosen to go behind the wheel or in a car with someone who was under the influence and then a, a collision occurs and there's injuries from that. So accidental injury is absolutely something that should be considered and knowing that um, this is a, one of the major contributors of death to young people, accident, in, accidental injury, which leads to death. And lastly is addiction. And you may hear folks say that in the past, oh, well, cannabis is not addictive. It absolutely is. And uh, there's actually a um, diagnosis in the DSM-5 for cannabis use disorder. And there are people uh, who are young people and adults who just... They need additional support and treatment in order to stop their use of cannabis. And so the changes that happen in the brain are consistent with addiction. And uh, that is why there is treatment programs and a diagnosis for cannabis use disorder. All right. So lastly, on cannabis, I do want to show you after all that information I just shared with you, something that is initial, but is something that looks promising. Again, this is a California Healthy Kids Survey data. On the left in the green bar is data from the 2007 administration. The blue bars on the right are the 2021 administration. And the idea here is that young people, when those years were asked in seventh, ninth, 11th grade, and NT means non-traditional or continuation schools, um, alternative ed sites. And so the idea here though, is you can see that as time has gone on, Literally half of the young people have stated they've ever used cannabis in their entire life. And Ventura County Behavioral Health is looking at this data to see what happened between 2007 and today, just to really shift that culture or that belief or that perception or whatever leads to the use of cannabis in young people. Why are each of them choosing not to use it by the time they were asked this question versus their, uh, their um, peers? who uh, preceded them in 2007 and earlier. So know that that's something that's being looked into. This is very early uh, uh, determinations and analytics in, in this data. Know that uh, as time goes on and research is done, this is something that will be looked at and reported on once they have some more information on it. And lastly, um, again, for non-traditional, it's really important because those are young people who uh, are no longer in a comprehensive mainstream school site and they go to an alternative ed site um, uh, or continuation, previously known as continuation schools or community day schools to continue their high school work or middle school work. Okay, the last substance I'm going to be talking about is opioids. And there's certainly um, an epidemic happening here, which you may have heard of on the news and other sources. And I'm going to talk a little bit about that, specifically about fentanyl, which you may also hear about quite a bit. So just so we all know, opioids um, are synthetic opiates. They are um, in pill form, pharmaceutical form. You can see examples of opioids there, oxycontin, vicodin, morphine, but also fentanyl, uh, as I mentioned. And we'll talk about that in detail in just a second. We know that as a classification, all opioids have a high risk of overdose, of dependence, and negative health effects. And um, they are meant to be painkillers. They're meant to uh, mitigate pain in people who use them. And they're very good at their job, but they're also so good at their job. And unfortunately, a person can develop dependence for it and it will lead to um, many, many negative effects as you'll see uh, as we go through here. But let's talk about fentanyl. So fentanyl, that doesn't take much, where if in the previous slide, we talked about overdose, dependence, and health effects, well, fentanyl, when we talk about overdose, it doesn't take much for it to be lethal. So you can see fentanyl can be lethal. As little as two milligrams of fentanyl can actually be lethal. And for some context, that's about the amount of fentanyl shown on the tip of this pencil. That amount can be fatal to a person who ingests it. Therefore, this photo from the um, DEA shows that uh, that amount of fentanyl next to the penny is enough to be lethal to several people. 
It's because it's 50 to 100 times more potent than the opioids I just talked about, 50 to 100 times more potent than heroin, which is its chemical or pharmaceutical cousin. Um, there's also the uh, high risk of overdose and dependence as well. But another layer around fentanyl, because it's so potent, it's being used to create fake pills. So this is from Ventura County Behavioral Health. And if you look at this slide, which one of these pills do you think is fake? Is it A or B? Well, A is the fake pill. And of course, the natural question is, well, how can you tell which one's fake and which one's not? Point is, you're not supposed to be able to tell. Unfortunately, when fentanyl is used to uh, lace uh, a fake pill, the intention is to sell that pill and it's stronger and uh, someone will be able to get the desired effects from it. But if someone thinks that they're buying a legitimate oxycodone or a prazolam and it's laced with fentanyl, they may take half of a pill or one pill thinking it's a certain amount, but they don't know that it's actually many times stronger than what they thought they were taking. And that's how people can accidentally overdose some of these products. So these are things to keep in mind. And again, the intention isn't to be able to tell the difference. The um, idea is to be able to have them look uh, uh, as legitimate as possible to be able to be sold to unsuspecting users. When we talk about overdose with opioids, overdose can occur easily and can be fatal, especially with fentanyl. And essentially what's happening here is uh, with, with the depression of the, um, uh, the, the body and especially the respiratory system, it slows down breathing, which is what really leads to death, almost like suffocating while unconscious. And this can happen in people who are even long time users. And it exponentially increases when someone's mixing fentanyl or opioids with other drugs, especially alcohol. Lastly, when we look at opioids and fentanyl, um, I have to share that there is a um, medication called naloxone or Narcan, they are interchangeable names, that can actually reverse an overdose situation temporarily. And you can see here, this is a um, nasal uh, uh, version of it on the left and then injectable on the right. And the idea here is that if a person is experiencing an opioid overdose, when Narcan or naloxone is introduced into them, uh, into their, their nose or injected into them, it will reverse that overdose temporarily. It will block the, uh, the um, receptors in the brain that are uh, being react uh, reacting to the opioids in the system. And then they will uh, regain the respiratory rate, regain consciousness, and they can be got, taken to an emergency department to for medical help. Know that um, there is a window of time that that can happen. They shouldn't just be given naloxone allowed to walk away saying, okay, they're better now. No, they need to get medical attention because they can go right back to that overdose situation and back to the slow respiratory uh, rate and back into the uh, situation that could be fatal to them. Um, know that Canaco Valley Unified School District um, certainly de deserves a lot of credit and that they're one of the first school districts in the County of Ventura to enact a policy to allow naloxone to be available at school sites and at district offices. The idea here, much like AEDs and EpiPens, is to have this available in case it's ever needed. Um, having these things at a, a public facing place is not an admission of a problem, it's an admission of an epidemic and knowing we need to be prepared in case that situation arises where somebody does need naloxone. The last thing I'll say about it, if somebody is experiencing a uh, overdose or a medical situation that is not opioid related, giving them naloxone or Narcan will have no negative side effects. Um, it will only, they will only react to it if they have opioids in their system. If they do not, it just won't do anything. So keep that in mind as well. And then Ventura County Behavioral Health has done a number of uh, data gathering uh, efforts to look at opioids. So you can see a couple of different measurements here. The first on the left is the opioid related deaths. Sadly, between 2016 and 2021, uh, our county experienced 653 opioid related deaths. However, we also experienced between 2014 and 2021, 1,457 lives saved because they were reversed 
by naloxone being introduced into the person who is having an opioid overdose episode. Note also that there's been 3,784 times that naloxone has been used by first responders. So I do wanna point a few things out here. When you look at that middle figure there of 1,457 lives saved, I would like to point out that had naloxone been around, we could have had up to 1,457 lives lost due to opioid overdose. And when you look at the last figure of 3,700, almost 3,800 uh, times that naloxone was used by first responders, well, why is that number so high? Sometimes a person is so deep into the um, into the, the overdose situation and they have so much on board, multiple doses of naloxone are needed in order to bring them back. And so remember, that's only a temporary uh, reversal and multiple doses were needed to bring them to a place where they have regular respiratory rate and they're able to get medical attention. So know that that's the efforts that have happened in the County of Ventura specifically around um, opioid related deaths and trying to prevent those by having naloxone available. And if you'd like to learn more about opioids specifically, the County of Ventura has three websites that are really great resources. You can see them there, fentanylventuracounty.org, venturacountyresponse.org, and coastventuracounty.org. And all of the information I presented to you about fentanyl and opioids was taken from those sites. I highly encourage you to check those out if you would like to learn more. Okay, so for my last section here, I would just like to talk about addiction and the teenage brain. Know that the teen brain develops until about the age of 25 years old. And the front part of the brain right here is the last part to fully develop. And that deals a lot with um, logic and reasoning and understanding. Uh, if I do this, it's likely this can happen. Cause and effect, um, actions and consequences, right? Which explains why a lot of times young people will do things impulsively and then realize, why did I do that, right? And maybe we think to our own adolescence and things that we had done and we think to ourselves, why did we do that? Or we think back now and think, why did I do that, right? So but lastly, because of that brain development though, young people unfortunately can become addicted faster than adults to substances. And that's because of the brain development that's happening, the rewiring that's happening in the brain during these years. And when substances are introduced, that rewiring is essentially hijacked. And they um, learn a lot of things or their brain learns a lot of things about substances that really make it think, well, well, if I feel good, if I feel bad, if I feel happy, mad, glad, whatever, no matter how I feel, I use this substance, I'm gonna feel good, no matter what. And that's a really, really slippery slope for young people during their teen years. And I hope you understand the risks that come along with that. So lastly, let me talk about the stages of addiction. And the, the if, I want you to imagine there being four stages for young people, for adolescents. The first is experimentation. And that's exactly what it sounds like. A young person's curious or um, they're peer pressured into using a substance for the very first time. They experiment with it. Some people may try it and they have a bad experience. They don't like the way it feels, whatever their case is. And they walk away, they never do it again. Or their brain thinks, I kind of liked that. That was interesting. That was a new feeling. It was fun, whatever they think but they think, okay, I would be interested in doing that again. So we do it again and again and again and again. And as their frequency of use you know, continues, they would go into the next stage, which could be referred to as social recreational use. There's a higher frequency of use here than in experimentation because they've used a second and third and fourth and fifth time and have gone on to continue to use. Maybe they'll use once every few months, once in a great while, only at parties, but with social and recreational use, um, there's something very interesting that happens in the teen brain. Remember I mentioned earlier about the brain's wiring and rewiring that happens during these years. Well, the brain starts making a connection that, you know, if going to the movies and hanging out with my friends is fun and using this substance is fun, then if I combine those two, I will probably be probably all fun. And so the brain starts associating fun times and positive experiences with substance use. And then it gets very difficult to separate those two things. And it becomes physically difficult to have fun without using. And young people may start experiencing things like, I don't really wanna to go to the party if there's not gonna be alcohol. 
or I don't really want to go hang out if we're not going to get high first. And that's an indicator of social recreational use, um, the stage uh, being present. So as they continue on uh, through their use, so they use again and again with higher frequency of use, they go into the third stage, which can be referred to as misuse. And the idea behind misuse here is um, there's a higher frequency of use, as I mentioned, but there, we may start seeing responsibilities that are lower in prioritization. Maybe academics go down, maybe uh, hanging out with certain friends goes down and other friends goes up. Uh, maybe other activities they used to do, like athletics or extracurriculars, it becomes a lower priority as well. And misuse and um, addiction or dependence, that last stage, they look very similar, but there is a distinct difference. That final stage there, there is a presence of a higher tolerance, meaning it takes more of the substance in order for the person to feel the effects, and the presence of withdrawal, where the person um, either feels physically ill when they're not using the substance and they have to use it to not feel those effects, or they feel uh, irritable or anxious or um, emotionally unwell when they're not using the substance. And know that when it comes to addiction, addiction is like a psychological compulsion or dependence is a physical need to use the, the drug. So if you hear those two terms, addiction and dependence, they are distinct, but they are both the last stage of this continuum know that there is something very important to, to take note of as well. So you'll see this dotted line here in the middle. This line represents something very important. In those first two stages, experimentation and social recreational use, if something bad happens in those two stages, uh, like they get caught, they get in a fight with their parents, boyfriend, girlfriend, best friend, um, or they uh, have you know a negative feeling, they get sick from using or overusing, um, in those first two stages, typically a young person will walk away and they'll say, you know what, not worth it. Um, I didn't like the feeling. I didn't like that. I got in trouble. And they will stop. They'll just continue their use and never use again. However, on the right side of the line, when those same types of things happen during those two stages, typically a young person, instead of recognizing that the substance might have been the cause of those issues, instead, they'll say things like, if I had have gone left instead of right, I wouldn't have gotten caught. If my parents would just get off my case, then this wouldn't be a problem. I could take care of my responsibilities, right? So they try and make justifications or excuses for how everything and everybody around them is the issue, not the use itself. And that's a very difficult cycle for them to get out of, again, because of the brain development and how it is hijacked by substance use during the teen years. And addiction causes permanent changes in the brain. And these changes can affect how a person responds to certain situations, even after they discontinue that use. And the example I'll give you of these permanent brain changes is if you think about, uh, if you've ever known a person who started use during their teen years and then stopped later on in life, let's say they started at 15 and discontinued their use 30 years later, right? So they may be uh, 45 years old, and they discontinue their use, but emotionally and um, socially, they may respond to certain situations like a 15 year old would. And that has a lot to do with the um, initiation of their use during their teenage years. And that development that many of us did during those teen years in young adulthood, we just didn't get to do because whenever something was hard, whenever something was bad, whenever something was fun, that substance was there to enhance it or to mask those feelings they had and they never learn to deal with those situations. So that's something to keep in mind as a um, long-term effect on use on the teen brain, and it leads, or it continues into adulthood. So I would like to leave you with um, some ideas and concepts here around communication. Communication is one of the key factors in prevention. And for parents, I want you to know that parents and families still have a significant influence uh, uh, on their children on young people in their lives. And the thing is though, they need to hear it from you before they hear it from a peer. Think back to our own adolescence. Um, at what point did we stop seeing our parents as resources, started seeing our peers as resources for information? We need to start those conversations early and talk often. Because if we tell them our expectations, our beliefs, and become a resource before their peers do, 
we can head that off and prevent from getting misinformation in others. And when you start that conversation early about substances and your expectations around it, that becomes the norm. You not only uh, let them know what your expectations are, they also know that you're someone who's open to talking about this sometimes difficult conversation. And I want you to know that saying nothing is still saying something. Sometimes saying nothing can be interpreted as permission to do things that you don't want your young people to do, you don't want your kids to do, but you never told them that you didn't want them to do it. So when it comes to substance use, all these points that come from the Substance, substance Abuse Mental Health Services Administration are really, really important considerations in having open communication with your children and young people in your lives about substance use. So I do wanna share this with you as well. Um, SAMHSA, the Substance Abuse Men and Mental Health Services Administration, is a really great website resource for parents. And it's samhsa.gov slash talk they hear you with hyphens in between each word. And you can see it on the screen there. I uh, highly recommend that folks who want more information, go check that out. They have a lot of really great tips and uh, reading material and things that you can use in thinking about how you wanna have this conversation or continue the conversation with your own children. And lastly, if you know anyone who is struggling with substance use, uh, know that the uh, Ventura County Behavioral Health Department has services for, for young people and adults alike in the County of Ventura. Um, anyone 24 seven can call the access line, which is 1-844-385-9200. And again, it's 24 seven, a live person will come on the phone and they will start you through that process. You could also email sudservices at ventura.org. That's sudservices at ventura.org to initiate that process over email as well. All right, at this point, I believe our um, folks from Conejo Valley Unified School District uh, had some questions that were asked during the live presentation that they will uh, post for folks to review and you um, can have access to those as well. And this presentation will uh, be accessible for you to keep and review later on as well. I want to thank you very much for joining me for this conversation and this presentation. I really enjoy uh, being able to give this information out to parents and community members. And I want to thank again the Conejo Valley, Conejo Valley Unified School District for inviting me to present. And um, thank you so much for watching and uh, hope you take care. Thanks.